I'm going to preach to you this morning from Psalm 23. Is there a better one? I don't think so. The guy that wrote it too, man, what a, what a solid dude, David as well. If you're new, that's my name, by the way. If you didn't get the joke, I want to help you out. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Stop there for a second. I just need you to know when his name is on the line, he's going to lead you well. Don't worry. His name is attached to you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That just means even though I walk through it. I was having Siri read it to me this week, and she kept going, yeah, though I walk through it. It's yay. <laughs> even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow, that's a good, that's a good word for us today. We were singing about it, David's speaking about it, we're going to talk about it today. Fear wants to keep you from the future that God has for your life. For some of us, um, fear is a very real, present thing in front of us. For others of us, it is a perspective that we must reorient with Jesus as our focus because the issue is not the wrong perspective we have. The issue is the wrong response we have. But if we have the wrong perspective, we're gonna have the wrong response. So today, I just feel like what, what God wants to put in our spirit today is how will we respond to a world full of fear? How will we respond to an enemy that wants to, around every corner, get you to be full of fear? Because ultimately, what I believe, what we were just even singing about a second ago, is there is a future that God has in store for you. The vision of this, this house all this year, Pastor declared that we are gonna forge ahead. You know why we forge ahead? We forge ahead because the future that God has for us is better than what we came from. It's better than what we had been going through. It's better than even some of the things we're going through now because the future is ahead of us and it's beautiful in God's sight and he has it for this church. This January, I, I will have been here with my family 25 years to get to see what God's done and the future is better than even the last 25 years. We just declare that, but fear will keep you from it. So pray with me, Lord. We just focus our hearts and our intention. I ask for open ears, open eyes, open hearts, open minds to receive of your word. This is your word. Lord, these are not my words. This is your word. And your word is truth. Your word is what sets people free. Your word, God, when it can get into our spirit, it gets down so deep, it changes us. God, I ask that your word would change us this morning. I ask that we'd have such a gravitational pull towards you, Jesus, that everything that has tried to keep us fearful, stuck away from going forward into the future, I pray that there'd be strongholds broken today, demonic strongholds broken in your presence today. As your word goes forth, it it's sharp and it's going to cut down every chain. It's going to cut down every stronghold. It's going to cut down everything that's trying to hold back the people of God from the future that you have for them. So I just declare today that David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil. And I ask that there be a fearless spirit that you put inside the people of God today, a courage, a bravery, a steadfastness to cling to your word and not the ever-changing words of this culture or of society or of social media or of politics or of man or woman. But Lord, we declare that your word is yes and amen. Your promises are true and God, you are a faithful God. And so help us, help us, help us 
to be faithful in the coming days to get the best that you have for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. If you got faith in the room, everybody says amen. Come on, lift up his holy and his awesome name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, let's get into it. Before you're seated, turn to somebody and say, I'm glad you're sitting with me. I'm a little scared. Come on. This is like your war partner you're sitting with. Thank him. Thank him for sitting with you. David's speaking of this thing, right, of, of walking through the valley. I think any of us could recognize that at some point in our life, what it means to walk through the valley. See, we weren't born into the valley, but we were born into sin. The Bible is very clear as Adam and Eve had fallen short, they had sinned. The Bible says that everyone, all of us, have fallen short of the glory of God. That means that each baby born is born into sin. I've never had to teach my kids how to disobey or sin. They have done it on their own every time because we were all born into it. So understand this. If we're born into sin, that means we're born into fear. And every one of us, maybe it manifests different. Maybe it's based upon personality or how you process information verbally or mentally or whatever it is. But there's something about each of us that in some way we gravitate towards, we can't help but struggle with fear. Some of you, it could be fear of heights, flying in planes, like, no bueno, ain't gonna happen. Fear of water, it could be snakes, spiders, anybody? Is anybody, like, itching as I talk right now? Like, some of you, it could be fear of public speaking. Like, you watch what pastor does up here every week, and you're like, <laughs> no, nah, I don't think so. But see, fear is a very real thing. Like, you can see it even on children from a young age, the point in which they begin to realize they've been born into fear. Like, take my sons, they're like polar opposite human beings, Zealand and Zion, like polar opposite. I asked my wife, I said, what's a couple fears I could describe that Z has to give people perspective of our kids? She says, it'd be easier if you just listed what he's not afraid of. It'd save you way more time. See, Z, he's afraid of Uncle Steve's remote control cars, probably because he torments him with them and like rides up them and stuff like that. He's afraid of like loud noises, like motorcycles or fireworks going off. He's... He's afraid of um, people in costumes, bearded men. So therefore, Santa Claus, because he has a costume and a beard. Z is basically afraid of anything that gives you an adrenaline rush in life. Um, he's afraid of our shark. It's like, the, it's, I think it's like shark brand, like little robot vacuum thing we have. That thing sounds like such a novel idea, like you program your house and it just cleans it for you when you're not gone, right? It sounds so great, but then you forget that when the kids are gonna leave the toys all over the floor, that thing's just basically like doing this. Like, it doesn't clean anything the whole time. So we're getting ready to sell ours, now that I've pitched it super well, if anybody wants to buy it. But we're not selling it because the toys, we're selling it because Z is terrified of this vacuum. Like literally when the vacuum, like when it would pick up and it get going, it'd take off as he would jump up. Bad robot, bad, no. He'd jump on the couch, he's terrified. That's Zealand. Zion on the other hand, <laughs> he loves all the things I just listed. He loves them all. He loves an adrenaline rush. That, that vacuum, when it takes off, he jumps on it and basically rides it like a little like, like uh, snowboard or like skateboard or something. Like he loves it. He's, he, the only thing I can think of, honestly, and it depends on the day that he's scared of, is Siri. That's like the only thing. We got this like little uh, iPod, uh, I, what is it called, like I home, home Pod Mini or whatever it's called, that's what it's called, in our house. And so Sid will like talk to it to play a song. He's like, now playing. And he like freaks out, like who's in our house talking right now? That ain't my mom. That's like, and then it just depends on the day. Sometimes he looks at it and laughs. Z Zion loves an adrenaline rush. Like when we were, uh, when we were on uh, vacation to Florida with my whole extended family. So you got Mana and everybody swimming and stuff, right? Mana's a hoot. She loves playing with Uncle Dave because I like give her that adrenaline rush that she's longing for. I will throw her as high as I can possibly get her until my arms can't do it anymore. She loves it. If I did that to Zealand, I think he would literally like disown me as his dad. Like he can't handle it. He's scared to even jump in the water. It's like he eventually will get the courage. It's like, watch me, Dada. And like Mana's just like full sending her body off like into it, right? And they have floaties and stuff, but Z's like, watch me, Dada. You know? Like, man is straight jumping into it. Zion doesn't give you any warning. 
he doesn't say, watch me, nothing. He sees the water and he's, he just throws his whole body into it. He did it, he did it one time, we weren't paying attention and we were all kind of talking and stuff and, and he threw his body into it. I'm like, where's Zion? I had to jump, we had to jump in and go after him. He was down there for like two, three seconds in the pool because he just threw his body in there. So now I'm like, at all times, I have to stay with this child for the rest of his life. <laughs> like he's gonna hurt himself. See, besides their personality being a little bit different in how they respond to fear, that is true, but also there is the reality check that Zealand is three, Zion is one, and over time, that even two years span, what's the difference? Zealand has learned about fear. He's discovered there's things to be fearful of, things that trigger him certain ways. See, Zion, he's still understanding this idea of what fear is. Although we're born into it, over time, we identify and we discover what it is in each of our lives. Each of us have triggers. We have things that grip us either emotionally or some of us like it, 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 it's, it's physically. It could be things that happen to our body and we're like panicking, like am I gonna die? No, you're actually, you're fine. But they become fears to us. It's the things that get our minds racing. It's the things that kind of really begin to either distract us or discourage us in so many different ways. And then as we learn fear over time, if you live life long enough, there'll be this moment as you've now learned what fear is, there'll be this moment where you have to see a valley in your life. What is the valley in your life? Maybe some of you feel like you're in it right now. Maybe some of the ones that are younger in the room listening right now, like they can't really identify it because they've not really had to walk through it, but at some point in your life, we all know this, you will have to walk through a valley. You will have to walk through something. See, if we didn't understand fear, we could walk through it and we wouldn't even think twice. But the issue is we understand fear. There are things that grip us. There's things that consume our minds. There's things that keep us up at night. So because we understand it when we see the valley, it is it's very taunting. It torments us. It, it could be in different ways. There's like six psychological basic fears that every human being struggles with. In some category, you're gonna, you're gonna land in one of these. It could be health issues. Um, it could be financial struggles. Getting older, that's real. Like as I even talk to my grandparents, like the, the older they've, they've gotten, it just becomes very difficult the way they have to deal with certain things in life. Loss of a loved one, that's real. Here's one that we can all resonate with. Fear of criticism and rejection from others. Anyone that says that that doesn't like bother them in any way, I'm sorry, I love you, but you're lying. Because none of us like to be criticized and none of us like to feel rejected. You don't deal with it very well. I think it's so funny as pastors, we've literally signed up, like pastors literally signed up to come here every week and put himself on the spot to deal with the criticism and rejection of people because he has to preach God's word every week. Let me reword that. He, didn't, he doesn't have to. He gets to preach God's word every single week. But you're putting yourself, your head on a chopping block of people's criticism and rejection. And that's real, that's a fear. Some people, number six, you fear death itself. Like, when you think of the idea of dying, it, it doesn't matter what age, but there's something in you, like you fear the, the idea that one day you're going to die. Then people ask, you know, the big questions that, thank God we have the answers for in his word, but like, what happens after death and all these things. These are things that people fear and that they're processing. For me, I get the, totally get the health issues thing. I get that. My valley's been cancer. It really has. Like, when I was, uh, when I was 32, and then realized that I had it, it, was, it, it became different. It was like, oh wow, so I've never really had anything bad happen to me before. I've never really lost anybody. I've, I, I've never had anything shake my world so hard. There's been things that have hit me, but this was different. This was clearly like, I'm looking down the barrel of the valley, and this is gonna be something different that I have to walk through. It was very clear in my mind. Every one of us, I think, in some way, we can come to grips with there is a valley that we're facing. That's what David's talking about. But can I help you understand, this is not metaphorical. David's not writing like nice poetry as a metaphor. This valley, it's literally called the shadow of death. It was an actual valley. It was a road that went from Jericho to Jerusalem. Jesus even talked about it in the New Testament. 
And David's describing this place that was treacherous. As a shepherd, he knew you do not bring your sheep there because they probably won't make it. It had really steep drop-offs, high cliffs, and so when the sun was in the sky, if it wasn't dead in the air, shining down, illuminating the valley, if it was before or after, then darkness would surround. So I was called the shadow of death because darkness would fill the valley. And as a shepherd, you knew taking your sheep there was very problematic because when the darkness descended, what was waiting for you? Wolves were licking their chops. Vicious and wild animals were waiting the moment it was darkness, which was for the majority of the time. They would enter in and they, they would prey on whatever was in the valley. David is describing something that I think a lot of us can resonate with in life in a lot of different ways. Now, this manifests in so many different ways. I think this can kind of click in our spirit in so many different ways. But this valley was a sheep's, was a shepherd's worst nightmare. Do you have something in your life like it happens and you literally go, my worst nightmare just came to pass? Like maybe like publicly, if I were to right now come to one of you and put the microphone in front of one of you, like you would melt. You're like, this is my worst nightmare. And like publicly in front of everyone, spotlight on me. Like it's whatever it is, but we have worst nightmares. We have even spaces in our life, just like David's talking about this space they travel through the valley of the shadow of death, that they kind of give us some like some tough feels to deal with. For me, in my house, I don't know how this is for y'all at night, but when it's dark, when it's late, I start hearing sounds in my mind that don't even exist in my house. Now listen, I know the doors are locked, I know the garage is shut, and I know I live in Dryden, <laughs> but I'm still scared. I have this hallway, and I, I, I named it the hallway of the shadow of death in my house, and I have this hallway, I have to walk, walk down, and I remember when I first bought the house, it was like the floors of creek and stuff, but see, the Lord had masked me to everything about this house. All that I could see is, Sid, one day, I see us throwing the ball with our kids in the backyard. Like, I can't, like I had so much of it. We saw like 30 houses before that, that Sid like loved, and I was like, this ain't it. We literally walk and I go, thank you for your time. I'm like, this ain't it. I walked in this house, and I'm like, the floors are creaking. When were they creaking? I don't know from the day I moved in, but I didn't think about it. But when you gotta walk down the hallway of the shadow of death and it's like, you know, like they're like, I don't know what that was. It's a demon in my floors is what it was. But when you gotta walk down it, it's scary. A couple months ago, I'm asleep, dead asleep, deep sleep. You know what I'm talking about? R-E-M, I'm in the REM sleep. It's like the kind of sleep, you know you're so deep, it's so good. If you wake up the next morning after that whole night's sort of deep sleep, you just recovered after three days and not sleeping. It's like, it's like it feels good. I was probably like dreaming about like candy canes, lollipops, uh, I don't know, cupcakes. And I'm in a deep sleep. And I'm laying there and I'm in this sleep and uh, Sid wakes me up. It was like a violent shake. It, I, like I thought an earthquake had happened in our house. She wakes me up and she hears, Dave, Dave. I've been trying to like wake up like, is this like princess of the lollipop land? Or like, you're, you're wondering like, is this reality? Am, am I asleep? Am I dead? What's happening right now? You know that, like that kind of deep sleep takes you a little bit to reorient. She wakes up, Dave, what, what? I was, I was sleeping so deep. She goes, there's someone in our house. <laughs> Just, I'm gonna look at the men for a second. I wanna see if any of them can resonate with what I'm saying. I go, what? She goes, there's someone in our house. <laughs> I was so calm from this sleep. I shot out of bed so quick. I ripped those covers off. I shot out of bed. My heart is racing a thousand miles an hour out of my chest. I like, I know two things. One, <laughs> now I want to explain to you this right here in my hand, although it's my fingers, this is not a toy. This can hurt someone if I must. I do not want to have to pull this trigger. But I know, number one, I'm going to be protected because number two, I got to walk down the hallway of the shadow of death right now. <laughs> and I'm going to walk in the dead of night. I'm going to have this. And I'm just like wanting to yell out, do not make me use this kind of thing, you know? I'm walking down the hallway. 
<laughs> you know, seriously though, my brother in the back gets it. You start breathing way heavier than you should. If the creaky floor wasn't a dead giveaway to who's in your house, your breathing absolutely will be. Because fear is slowly entering in. I'm playing out worst case scenarios, right? I've been trained and I understand like if I'm gonna pull even this trigger, I'm playing these things out, this is real. Like to stop this intruder, like I pray to God I don't have to. I'm thinking about worst case scenarios. I'm already calling 911 in my mind. Like I know it's crazy, but I'm scared. And I'm walking down the hallway and it's like every single like uh, cop show, I don't know, Magna P.I., that's why I got the mustache, like every single one of them, I'm like playing it out, going down that hallway, I'm shooting around, I'm going, bringing it over. I'm I went around the whole house, ain't no one there. I go back to my room, I knew to be smart enough to put the gun away because I was about to kill Sid for waking me up. And I knew, just get this out of here, let's lock that up, let's not even deal with that. There's no one in our house. She goes, I swear I heard something. Well, listen, I was listening to like the, lolly, the lollipop fairies and all them, so I'm gonna go back to hang out with them right now. Like, I, I know I'm like having fun with this a little bit. This just happened like a couple of months ago. Maybe you've had a scenario, maybe a heart racing moment though, your heart gets racing. This is what fear is like though. It really is. It deceives us. It tells us things that, we think are there that are not actually there. You see a shadow, you think it's something. Like, if you got like a coat rack or something, if, if I had one of those, that thing was getting shot for sure. Like, <laughs> but fear kind of begins to get into your system and fear for a lot of people begins to create anxiety. And anxiety begins to set in and that's when you can't breathe straight and that's when you think you can't go out in public and that's when you think you can't be around people and that's all this, and all this stuff and panic attacks and all this stuff because fear has gotten into your bloodstream. You're unable to think straight, your mind's spinning, you can't make decisions. For many people, I've watched them, they become faithless. Where they once believed that anything was possible with God, fear strips you of faith. And you're standing there without wearing any faith, without anything to face this enemy in front of you. Most of you, it's your mind is the enemy. And it begins to creep in in such a way that you find yourself, what do I, what do, I do next? And you're, you're kind of jittery and you're running all over. And the issue is not the running, the issue is you're running aimlessly. You're running without direction or vision. But you are. You're running, where do I go, what do I do, Who do I, uh, how's this gonna work, like are we gonna be able to pay for this and what, what if they don't come back home and what, like, what if I don't get out of this hospital and, and you just start running. So I just love how David speaks with God's word and truth here, Psalm 23. Did you pick it up? Because so many of us find ourselves running around, wandering, spinning in circles, no clarity. What did David say? Please get this in your spirit this morning. David said, yay, meaning even. Even though I, catch the word, walk. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Not even though I run. Not even though I wander all over. Not even though I'm, I'm questioning, I'm skittish, I'm wondering. David's saying, take a breath. Remember who your God is. Take a breath. Breathe in some faith again to know what is possible for the people of God. And I want you to slow your pace down, he's saying, and just walk. Just walk. See, really, there's two types of people in the room that aren't walking if you're not walking. Number one, it's because you're running and you're all over the place and you're so full of fear and so full of anxiety. Or there's others of the room you're like, your feet are glued to the ground. You're not going anywhere. So pastor puts out a vision like, we're gonna forge ahead. You realize forge ahead requires movement, right? You have to move forward in a direction. And so many of you, you've, you, you've lived in the same space, same head space, same faith walk, faith, faith stand, it's not a walk. You gotta move for it to be a walk. 
and you've been living in the same spot of your faith, same spot of your mental space, whatever it is, for so long, and God's just kind of saying like, you need to move. You don't need to run. You don't need to be all over the place. You don't, you don't need to be clouded. You just need to move forward. I think a lot of people you struggle because you, you, I hear people all the time says, man, I just feel like if I take one, one step forward with God, it's just two steps back. Well, that's fine. Take two steps back and take another step forward. Just keep moving forward. Because the only thing that's worse than sometimes being pushed back is that you stop going forward at all. And there's so many different people that I see this, they do this in their lives. They do this in their marriages. They do this with their finances. They just stop moving forward. They stop believing that God's hand could be on them. They stop believing that what God has next for them is better than even what was last. And so they just stop. They go, it's gonna get worse. If I, if I try anything else, if I do anything else, I only know my life's gonna get worse. And David's saying, keep moving forward. See, the only way that you can overcome fear is you just keep walking. Where do you face yourself like when you keep walking? See, a lot of people, they don't understand it's, it is this simple. We just make it so complex. If you're gonna overcome fear, then you have to face the valley. A lot of y'all know that the valley's here, but you're kind of like, I can't look at that. I can't, I can't handle that. I, I won't be able to overcome David's saying in the scripture, through the spirit of the living God, he's telling you today, get something in your spirit to turn yourself around and you face the valley. Amen. You look at it head on. You recognize, yeah, I, I understand that this is what's in front of me. I understand this feels like it's impossible to overcome. I understand that this is gonna be really scary when the darkness descends. But some of you gotta get this inside of your spirit today, face the valley. I can't trick you into doing it, and I can't force you into doing it, and neither will the Lord. But the Lord is looking for willing people, willing vessels, that say, I will willingly look at the valley of the shadow of death. I will face it, let's get even crazier, and I will enter it. I will look at whatever's in front of me, and step by step, a little bit of walking at a time, I will enter it, because facing it's only step one. Entering it is step two. Do you know what this does when you do this? This sends a resounding message to hell. Get your hands off of me. You cannot control me. See, this literally, this, this, you're telling the devil, listen, I know you try, you're scare, trying to scare me with this, but I'm not gonna fear this. I'm gonna face this. I'm not gonna let this overcome me. I'm not gonna let this speak into my heart and my soul. And it gets real, doesn't it? This gets real. Like, we ain't playing make-believe here. We're talking about real-life situations, scenarios that every single one of us are walking through. For David, it was the darkness and the vicious animals that could come against him and his sheep. But for us, it's scary medical results. It's when you pick up the phone and the doctor tells you something different than what you thought. It's stuff with family that you, you don't think that you have the capacity to face today. It gets real, real fast. It does. Especially the world we live in today. I mean, you, you turn on the news, I'm wondering when, when's the next nuclear war? When's the next nuclear attack gonna happen? When's the next shooting gonna happen somewhere? When's the next time that in a, in a, in a mall or whatever it is, See, the devil, he, you realize he's trying to even intimidate the people of God so we won't come together and have church. He's trying to scare us so we won't show up. This is a valley for many pastors, many churches, that they're too scared to even walk through it. Many churches, that's why they shut down. They never came back together after COVID and, and quarantine in 2020. Why? Because it, it was a valley they were too scared to walk into. Some of you, it's social anxiety, loneliness. I, I'll even tell you, I think, like reality check here, I think that it is um, religious persecution. Like right now what we're seeing on social media or in politics, this is nothing. Hear me, pastor's been saying it, listen up. 
It is coming in the flesh to America very soon. And it will be a valley that people will decide, am I too scared to keep serving Jesus? Or am I going to continue in my faith and walk through this valley, even though it's very evil in, my, in this culture, very evil in this world, I'm gonna keep walking through it. Because to not serve Jesus and to not walk through the valley, it's a whole lot worse after I take my last breath than it, to just walk through it. But it's coming, church. It is coming. Like, are we gonna be strong enough in the faith? Are we gonna resist this fear that wants to grasp us? I'll tell you, you look right now in politics and in laws and the world and all this thing, everybody's protected but Christians. Every religion's protected. Every people, any people that they identify as this or this or that, but basically, if you're in the box of I'm a man, I'm a woman, I believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and I could keep going. If you're in the box of the Bible, you're not protected. You are protected only by the blood of Jesus because this world isn't gonna do you any favors. It's not. It's gonna be a valley. It really is. It's going to be some things in the next coming days that we're gonna have to face as a church, not just as individuals, but as a church we're gonna have to face. What do you do? You face and then you embrace the valley. You hold on to it. A lot of people are like, well, yeah, I wanna walk through it, I just wanna hurry up and get through it. What if some of the greatest miracles, the greatest outpouring of his spirit would happen while you're in the valley? Because for me, I've seen people touched by God, I've seen miracles, I have literally been able to share Jesus with more people than I ever did before I had cancer. So we're not just called to face it, we're called to embrace it to walk through and be like, God, I know this is a season. I know this is hard. I know this is troubling. I know this is darkness. But I believe that you will illuminate my life in the greatest way in the midst of the valley. Face, don't embrace. Walk, don't run. Why? Because the valley is just a setup for your victory. It is the very setup. It's the, it is the thing beyond it. It is beautiful beyond it. Do you realize that the valley is the gateway to your future? If you don't enter it, you can't get the best of what God has for you. See, beyond it is the best. I felt like God, when I was uh, um, praying over y'all, praying over this message, he gave me a picture of uh, widows, specifically, people that have lost a spouse. And I felt like he told me that so many of them, they could look back before the valley and they could say, well, this was my best days. You have no idea how much I've lost. It can't get better than this. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me to encourage you today, reorient your focus. And I know that this looks dark, but if you will walk through it, the best days that God has for you are still in front of you. And specifically, I felt like he told me also, people in their like their 70s and 80s. And listen, I know I'm not there. So I'm only speaking the truth of God's word. I have no experience to back what I'm currently saying right now. But it'd be really easy in the latter years of your life to be like, man, I used to remember when I could move like that and, and run around and I had the energy like that and all that, and I get that. But I wanna, I wanna just encourage you today, if you're an older generation or if you've fallen into these categories, the faith that you carry, we need that faith as this church in the valley. The message of Jesus that you carry, we need that in this valley. Like without you, we do not have the same strength. You're a pillar to this house. You hold us up. And if you start believing that the best days were behind you, how can we lean into your wisdom and your faith to believe that the best days will be in front of us if you don't believe it? And I just wanna, wanna remind some people in the room that this is the setup for victory for you. This is the setup for your future. God has something for you beyond what you currently see to be dark or clouded or the weariness that you are in right now. I'm letting you know that there's something beyond it. What did David say? David said, I'm telling you, when you get past the valley, there's something waiting for you. What did he say? He said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. See, this table that David's talking about here, it was an ancient Hebrew banquet tradition that they would have. 
where the king would throw this massive banquet, this massive party, and it'd be outside so that everybody could see it. And if you were on the guest list, then it would, it would be known to all your enemies, whether that is like actual enemies, jealous friends, whoever it was, but it was known one thing, that you had the king's favor, that you got invited to sit at the table, and not everybody did. See, when fear faces you, favor chases you. Do you think that we face these things without purpose? If you're going to have to face fear, then God is gonna bring favor on your life. I ain't talking about financial prosperity and all this kind of crazy stuff that preachers talk about. I'm talking about the blessing. I am talking about prosperity. I'm talking about moving forward. Listen, I believe, I believe in this season, the Lord was speaking to me that I was in the last season. I was in a season of just waiting, waiting, waiting. And the Lord gave me a new word. He said, hey, you've been waiting, but now I want you to start walking. See, I could be waiting forever, like, Lord, when are you gonna heal me? When are you gonna? It does not matter. It matters that I keep walking. Why? Because if I'm willing, whether I have cancer or not, to just keep walking, then I can come to this place where I'm seated at a table with him. What matters ultimately is not what you're walking through or what you're going through. It matters that there's a destination that makes it worth it. And in the, in the faith, that destination, it's right here with Jesus. It's Jesus versus everything. It's Jesus over everything. You know, he ends this, he ends this, this verse in verse, verse four, verse five. He says, my cup runs over. So as he's seated at this table, he's making this point. I love it in the NASB, New American Center Bible. He says, my cup overflows. So as I'm seated at the table with the king, my cup is overflowing. That's, that's good right there. He's saying that my cup is pouring more and more. That's, that's, that's enough, thanks. My cup keeps pouring and pouring and pouring. That's good, that's good. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You get my point. We speak to God like that's good, that's enough. We do not serve a God of that's enough. It's not in his vocabulary. We serve a God of more than enough. I wanna teach you two principles of the cup, two reasons to keep walking, two reasons to make it to the table, what David's showing us here, two principles of the cup. Number one, we do not serve a God of that's enough. We serve a God of more than enough. We serve a God that wants to overflow in your life, not fill you up halfway, not fill you up just to the top. He wants there to be excess and overflow. He wants to bless you. I feel like a lot of people can take this one of two ways and mess it up both times. They either go, oh, God wants to bless me and be rich. That is not what I just said. Or you're like, no, God doesn't care about me. It's because you have a poverty mindset of the heart where you only ever see what you don't have. And you are so misplaced on what God's given you that you don't utilize it to its full potential because he's given you great things. He's overflowed in your life. If you're, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he only overflows. So if we serve a God of blessing and a God of overflow, then can I help you this morning? You don't need to steal from God. He wants to give it to you. You don't have to steal it. You can pay your tithe. It's a principle of the Bible. We give to God generously. I give above and beyond. I'll even tell you like practically, Sid and I, we make it a goal of ours to give at least 20% of our income to the work of God at this church. Why? Because we know that we don't have to rob God to get the overflow. We can freely give to him all that we have and he just keeps pouring it out more and more and more. You don't have to rob people from being generous to others outside of this church. You don't have to work overtime to get it. Like you can not only, I'm talking financially, I'm talking about of your time, I'm talking about being here in this house and I'm not even gonna say I'm preaching the choir. Maybe this is the first time somebody in this room, I wouldn't know, but you haven't been here in a long time. I wanna let you know, when you don't plant yourself here consistent with God, you don't get overflow because you're robbing him. 
It's, it's called remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. You and your family, you come here. And there's nothing like corporately worshiping, digging into the word of God, fellowshipping with the believers. That's called overflow. But principle number two I need you to understand is that when the attacks come on your life, when things hit you as hard, like a ton of bricks like the devil can do, if you just stand there and do nothing, he's just gonna overcome you. So you know what it's gonna take? It's gonna take pouring out. It's gonna take an emotional and a spiritual emptying of your cup. It's called spiritual warfare. So when you go to prayer, you don't just take it and lie down. You go to prayer. You say, devil, you have no hold over this house. This house is covered in the blood. When you start praying like that, it takes energy. It spiritually drains you. It emotionally drains you. When the attack of the enemy comes and you know that you're surrounded by your enemies, it drains you. So what's my point? It's gonna take from the overflow, you pour it out. The problem is not that many of you get drained when you pour out. The problem is you don't get filled back up. How do you get filled up? When we get in our word, when we spend time in prayer, like an actual time where we, I'm not saying pastor's messages on Sundays. I'm saying like outside of this, you open the Bible on your own. You chose to do it. You set aside time where you want to talk to God. Maybe just turn on worship music and sit and just listen. You know what that is? It's getting filled back up. You join a circle. You start fellowshipping with the believers. You're here, whatever it is. All of these things. What did David say? He said, you make me lie down. It's like when I, when I was a teenager, my mom made me come home and go to bed at eight o'clock, tick me off. Why? She knew I needed the rest. She knew I needed some deep rim that one day my wife would ruin David said, you make me lie down on green pastures. You lead me beside the still waters. What do he say? You restore my soul. You refresh my soul. You rejuvenate me, Lord. If you're not in God's presence consistently, if you're not with the people of God consistently, you don't get restored, you don't get refreshed, you don't get refilled. So the issue is not whether or not God wants to overflow. The issue is there will take a pouring out of your life. Y'all know how it is, especially if you're parents. It, it feels like it's nothing but pouring out. But especially when fear comes, it will take a pouring out. So what do you need to do? You need to come to the Lord with an empty cup and you need to find a moment where you can get your soul restored. Because we don't serve a God that just wants to fill you up. We serve a God that wants to overfill you. A God that wants to continually pour more and more and more into your cup. See, the reason that he wants to overflow in your life because he knows the attacks of the enemy that are at your doorstep. He knows the devil's schemes. He knows that the devil, he wants to discourage you. He wants to destroy your family. Listen, it's gonna take some energy getting in God's presence and going to war if you wanna keep your family. If you want your family to be with you in heaven, then you're gonna have to pour out. So he's a God that knows this. If you're gonna have to pour out, then he's gonna have to fill you right back up till overflow. Why? Because it's great. I don't wanna be filled to the top. I wanna overflow. I want my life to flow onto other people. I want other people to be blessed just because I'm blessed. They didn't even do anything to earn it. They just knew me because I know Jesus. I want overflow to come out of my life. And when the attacks of the enemy comes, I wanna be ready to go to spiritual warfare because I have that overflow, because I'm filled up. You got a target on your back. Listen, if you don't want to take the name of Jesus, you're good. Keep going. Devil won't mess with you. You're a waste of his time. He's going to focus on people that are serious about following Jesus. I'm helping you out with that thought too. But if you're going to take on the name of Jesus, if you're going to be a menace to hell, you got a target on your back. There has been a full-fledged assault on you and your family to keep you from making it through the valley because he knows if he can keep you from stepping in, then he can keep you from the table that he's prepared, that the Lord has prepared for you. Why? Because God's not sending you into the valley. David said, even though I walk, what's the word? He's bringing you through the valley. We don't serve a halfway God. We serve an overflow God. 
We serve a God that brings you through the valley, a God that pours out and overflows, a God that, you know what? David said, Psh, I should have known it was giving me an overflow of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Another translation, I lack nothing. I will always have what I need. I will always be provided for. I will always overflow with the Lord. But see, the devil, he tries to attack these things and he tries to intimidate you. That's a key word. He tries to intimidate you to keep you from going forward like God has for you. So some of you, what's gonna happen? You're gonna leave this day. You're gonna say, man, I'm gonna go to prayer tomorrow morning. I'm gonna get restored, refueled. I'm gonna get ready. I'm gonna have the overflow walking into Monday. And you're like, I'm gonna step into this valley. You know what the devil's gonna do? He's gonna send evil into the valley. The minute that you step into that valley, he's gonna send evil right in front of you. Yes, did I pick somebody with a beard so even Z would be scared? I did. I did. He's gonna send something your way. Listen to me, key word, to intimidate you. It's very important that you understand this because let me show you the principle of this. We don't stop, we walk. We serve a God that already told us he'll bring us through, that already is preparing a table, even as before we even get through the valley, you realize he's preparing the table knowing that you're gonna be there. In the same way, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Why? Because he knows that you're gonna be faithful to make it. You're not gonna give up. You're gonna keep walking. You're gonna stay true with your marriage. You're gonna stay true with your family. You're gonna stay true being connected to his church. He's already preparing a place for you. So we're gonna enter this and we're gonna be ready. And it's like, okay, I can overcome this, I can do it. And then we start to get intimidated. But let's just like pull the curtain for a second. Let's, let's, let's see the wizard behind the curtain. If you were to walk through the valley and understand this, evil can't touch you. But that is the problem, it's pure intimidation. We set ourselves up and we're like, oh my gosh, it's so big and scary, like I can't go through this. Like when I heard the word cancer, I don't care who you are, I don't care what stage they say it is, where it is, what, what's going on. The word cancer is a scary word. It's an evil, demonic disease that belongs back in hell. It ain't my cancer. It's the devil's cancer. It's hell's cancer, but it ain't my cancer. And people always go, my anxiety. It ain't your anxiety. It belongs in hell with the rest of evil. But see, we see this, we're like, cancer. He's just saying walk. He's saying, because if you walk, it can't touch you. So what the devil does is he uses lies and deception to make you fearful, to intimidate you, to make it bigger than it actually is, to make you feel like you can't overcome it, to make you feel like it's not possible. And he just twists and turns all of his lies around you to make you feel like this evil is more powerful than it actually is. Do you know why? It's because you're looking only through the lens of fear. If you would put on the glasses of faith and look through those lens, you would see this thing can't touch me if it wanted to. Why? You are covered in the blood of Jesus. He shed his blood on the cross for you that so no evil thing. You're gonna tell me that, that good, the good blood of Jesus shed on the cross, that that doesn't trump this evil? This evil has no chance to stand up against the work that Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. But a lot of us, we get, we get confused. Like evil, I can't overcome evil. Oh, I can't do it. See, the reason that you just need to keep walking, the reason that you just need to keep going through the valley is because if you don't walk forward into the valley, what you're telling yourself, God, and everybody else is that you're all alone and that there's no one with you. But David said in verse four, he said, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Who's with them? Who carries a rod and a staff? Verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. See, we have a shepherd that wants to walk with us through the valley. We have a shepherd unlike any other shepherd. Can I tell you what the problem is? Many times, because we've placed such high priority on things that are not of God, they bring fear in our life. So um, if we place a high priority on money, you'll fear losing it. If you place a high priority on the opinions of people, you'll fear their criticism. But see, when the Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing and I shall not want, if I have everything I need in him, then fear can't touch me. So what happens a lot of times 
is some of your fears are coming from a place simply is if you would just make the Lord your shepherd, you would not have to deal with some of the things you are. What am I saying really? I'm saying this very simply. A lot of your fears are rooted in the fact that you call Jesus your savior, but you don't call him your shepherd. Save me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. I don't hear enough people saying they'll lead me, Jesus. Lead me not to be with these people anymore. Convict me, Holy Spirit. Lead me not to put that in my mouth anymore. Lead me not to look at that anymore. Lead me not to go there anymore. And so what we do is we're, we come here and it becomes religion if we're not careful. And every week it's like, forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Save me. Listen, if you do it one time with an actual repentive heart to give your life to Jesus Christ, your sins have been forgiven. Jesus said he puts it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to remember it no more. If you repent before the Lord, it's done. You don't need to keep asking him to save you. He already did it. You need to ask him to be your shepherd and to lead you. Because the problem is not that you need saving. The problem is that you need leading Jesus spoke about this when he went before the people. He said, I see the people, and they're like sheep without a shepherd. We, as the people of God, we need leading. You're crazy to think that you're gonna walk through the valley with just a savior. I need a shepherd. I need a rod that will defend me against the wolves coming. I need a staff that will direct me. And at times, I need a rod that will discipline me as well. I understand that. But see, when the devil starts throwing this kind of stuff at me, ooh, when he stepped forward, it made my heart race. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> and I already knew this was planned and my heart was still racing. To intimidate me, do you know what I do? This is the truth. I start telling the devil, I start telling evil who my shepherd is because I know who my shepherd is. I think about it and I just think of every way. Just, I go, devil, I don't think you realize how good my shepherd is. I don't think you realize how big my shepherd is. I don't think you realize that his promises are true, that he's got a call on my life. I don't think you realize that my shepherd, he's never left me or forsaken me. Do you understand this, church? It's not that he is just for you. He's with you in the valley. Different perspective now. See, you thought you were facing the valley and the evil and the fear on your own. You're not. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want because as long as I have him leading me, I'm in good hands. As long as he's in control. Some of you need to hear this today. You are not alone. The Lord is with you. The Lord will walk with you if you will just get the feet moving and keep walking. He's already in front of you. He's walking with you, church. I'm not alone. I tell myself that. The last two years, I'd tell myself that. I'd come and I'd sit at the table that the Lord had prepared, and I'd just sit there. And I'd just remind myself, because we can't see him, right? So it becomes, it becomes difficult at times in faith. I am not alone. I can promise you that over the last two years, I've never once looked in the mirror and seen myself as somebody with cancer. I have always seen myself as somebody with Jesus. Five years ago, I preached out of this text when my mom was going through cancer. And the Lord led me. It was crazy. It was like just like a, a whirlwind of memories thinking about what my family went through. And just, the, just, just, it's all fear. It's mainly emotional and mental for the most part. It's just fear just grips you. I'll never forget when my dad called me on the way home, uh, on the way to the church, he said, you boys need to get to the church. And he called us to tell us that mom was healed and there wasn't cancer anymore, but he didn't tell us that on the phone. So I raced the whole way there. And I'll never forget when the fear started coming on me. The song, uh, The Cross Has the Final Word came on. And I was like, okay, that's good. I'm, I'm gonna take that guy, I'm gonna cling to that. But I find myself these years later now seated at a table again. A table that the Lord prepared for me. Technically, I need one more chair for Jesus because I'd like him to sit down. 
I want fellowship with him. But I have four chairs to symbolize my wife, Sydney, my son, Zealand, my son, Zion, and myself. Then the same way when my mom went through it five years ago that my family sat around the table, a table that we knew the Lord had prepared. I sit here again knowing that my cup still is overflowing with the goodness of God. See, David never said that we wouldn't have to face some scary stuff in the valley. What did he say? He said, I'm sending you a shepherd that will go in front of you in the valley. I'm pre preparing before you a table that once you make it through, I'm letting you know that my best is waiting for you. The future's waiting for you. Don't stop walking. Can I encourage you, church? It gets even better. He said, I don't just put this in front of you. David talked about what the Lord brings behind us. He said in that last verse, verse six, he said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. They'll follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So watch this. Wherever I go, goodness and mercy, they just have to follow me. Wherever I walk, whatever I do, goodness and mercy have to follow me. Because the, the Lord is so much less concerned about what you have to face because he already knows he's with you. He's so much more concerned, what? Is it that they'll follow me? Is it that they'll just go wherever I go? Or is it more, that he's more concerned that we'll follow him? And when we follow the shepherd, goodness and mercy will follow us. David said this, he's showing us, if you'll follow the shepherd, he said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, he said, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord Forever, he's saying. Hey, hey, hey Grandma, can I, can I help you? I heard you say you needed me. Uh, sorry, I'm, one, second, one second. I'm a little confused. I was just about to, I could feel it. This was going to get in their spirit. They're going to walk out. Um, no, sir, I, I'm, I'm missing it. What's going on here? You said, David, surely... Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. The squad just got bigger. Okay, let's do it then. David said, surely goodness and mercy, they'll follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm gonna go off script for a second. I'll get this in your spirit. The older you get, the harder it is to have the courage to come up here and do this. You are looking on a fearless woman of God right here that came up and did this. I'm so proud of her. Don't tell me you can't walk through the valley. Okay, ready? Back in the character, here we go. Let's change perspective. Let's change attack plan a little bit. You ain't facing the evil alone. You're not facing the valley alone. Last time I checked, there is more for you than are against you. And greater is he who is in you than is in this world. So if you think that the response of the enemy, when you begin to walk into this valley with your shepherd, with goodness, mercy, and surely following you. If you think the response of the enemy is gonna be anything but to run with their tail between their legs in fear because they know that you have a shepherd that is with you, that is for you. Come on, somebody, we're gonna give the Lord a praise break for 10 seconds. Get on your feet and you give the Lord a shot of praise today. You are not alone. Come on, somebody glorify his name. You are not alone. remain standing. You serve a good God who is not just for you, he's with you. The question is, are you with him? A 
I'll pose it again. I've already discussed it, but let me pose it now to your spirit for response. Let me tell you where I'm at. I don't just need a savior. I need a shepherd. I know that my emotions will mislead me. I know that my decision-making on my best day will mislead me. I need a shepherd. For some of you today, your first step that you get to make with Jesus is making him the Lord and the Savior of your life. To confess that you've sinned. To acknowledge that you're in need of a Savior. And I wanna give that opportunity for some of you, but I also wanna give a second opportunity for some in the room that you've been playing this game where it's like, Jesus, save me, save me, save me. At what point that he keeps throwing you the life raft and you keep doing this all over again, are you sick of it yet? Are, 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 you not, are you not understanding that Jesus said that we would do greater things than even he did? Why? Because he sent us the Holy Spirit that when we go and face that valley, we don't run, we don't get discouraged, we walk with the confidence that we have a shepherd that is with us and the spirit of the living God inside of us. And God wants to empower some people in this room today to help you understand that some of your decision-making, some of your habits, some of your tendencies, some of your response to fear, all of this is because Jesus may be your savior, but you've not given him complete control yet to be your shepherd. So if you'd bow your heads and close your eyes this morning, just in God's presence this morning, I wanna give you an opportunity to, to really respond to the Lord. If you're here and you know that, you've never made a decision to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, to forgive you of your sins, to throw your past and all of that who you used to be into that sea of forgetfulness that you might walk forward knowing that you are forgiven, that you are a child of God, that you are loved by God. And as my son Zeeland, when, when we sit down and have to discipline and I have to, as a shepherd with him, use the rod and staff. He acknowledges, I don't wanna go to hell, I wanna be in heaven with Jesus. He literally explains that to me, even at the age of three. And in your heart and your soul today, there's some people that God's wanting you to talk to him about this and acknowledge today that you want heaven with him, that you want the life that he has planned for you. So if that's you, if you've never listened to me, You've never made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. I want us to get honest and real today. I want you to put your hand up. You've never done it before. Thank you over here. Appreciate you so much, brother. Thank you so much right here. Thank you so much, sir, over here. Come on, this is amazing. Thank you, y'all. Thank you so much. I hey, picked your head up for a second. I know that y'all didn't get to witness what I just did, but I counted at least four or five people that uh, for the first time, they just made Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life. So I wanna celebrate that. Thank you, Jesus. Well, since our heads are up, let's just do it with all heads lifted and all eyes open. If we can't follow them in here together, how are you gonna follow them outside of here? You're saying today, I need to make Jesus my shepherd, like truly make a commitment today that I'm gonna follow him because I've been trusting my own emotions. I've been letting fear misguide me. I've been letting friendships or relationships or substances or whatever it is that I know are not honoring to God and not the way he would lead me. And some of you today, listen, your rod, the, his rod and his staff, they're a comfort to you because if you don't let him start leading you, you will not make it to the end in heaven like he has prepared. And you want to acknowledge today, I need him to be my shepherd. If that's you, put your hand up. I need a shepherd. I don't, I don't just need a savior. I need a shepherd. I need a shepherd. Amen. Hands up all over. Come on, let's pray together. Prayer of faith, acknowledging he's our savior, but also we need him to be our shepherd. Say, Jesus. Come on, loud and clear. Say, Jesus, I acknowledge today that you're not only my savior, but I need you to be my shepherd. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I know that you will lead me well. I trust you through the valley because I believe 
that you've prepared a table before me. And my future days are my best days. I acknowledge that I've sinned and I need your forgiveness. But I also acknowledge today that I want to be used of God. I want to step from my fear into complete faith, knowing that where you lead me, I will follow because I want to be used for your glory. I pray this in the awesome name. Come on, say the name above every name. The name that is my Savior. The name that is my Shepherd. I pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, come on, say amen. Give a shot of praise.